They're composed of carbohydrate, everybody knows that, but they also have protein and fiber and essentially no fat. White potatoes are naturally very low in fat. There's some there, but very little. And what's so cool is the fiber. It has soluble, insoluble fibers and resistant starch. You are listening to Veggie Doctor Radio, and this is episode number 177. Welcome to Veggie Doctor Radio. I am your host, Dr. Yami, board certified pediatrician, certified lifestyle medicine physician, certified health and wellness coach, author, speaker, mother, wife, and human being. I passionately believe in the power of diet, habits, and mindset in sparking and sustaining well being and joy in our lives. This podcast combines expert interviews and thoughtful monologues to explore plant-based nutrition, lifestyle medicine, parenting, mindset, and other exciting and fun topics. I hope that these episodes inspire you, uplift you, and equip you with the knowledge and tools to live your best life. Are you ready to get started? Let's do it. Welcome back, veggie lovers, to another episode of Veggie Doctor Radio. I am up to the wire. My poor podcast producer is having to wait on me so that she can edit these podcast episodes, but it's been busy. I have been so busy at the office and with life and with everything, but I am committed to continue to bring you weekly quality episodes So this one is going to be on the potato. The potato, poor little innocent potato has been made out to be this villain, this evil food, but at the same time, we love potatoes. We love potatoes so much. Just think of how often we actually eat potatoes. Now, the ways in which we eat potatoes here in the United States may not be the most health promoting, but you have to admit that we love potatoes and we eat a lot of them. Now in this episode, I'm going to be talking specifically about the white potato, not the sweet potato. They're two different things. They're only distantly related, believe it or not. They come from different families. I'll talk about that a little bit more later, but I just want to start off with that. I will be talking about sweet potatoes separately in another podcast episode, because I know we love those too, but I want to give the white potato its own episode. I think it deserves that after all of these years, the poor white potato. All right, so let's start with defining what is a potato. So it is a starchy vegetable. It is technically a tuber, which is different from a root vegetable. There's just some little particular differences. So it's a tuber, which is part of the root, how it grows out and it makes that bulbous thing, which we know as a potato. And it originated in the Americas. Probably one of the reasons why we love them so much is because they are native to this area that we live this part of the world. The white potato belongs to the nightshade family, which also has been blamed for a lot of things, but also included in the nightshade family are tomatoes, eggplant, and peppers. And like I said, white potatoes are different from sweet potatoes. Sweet potatoes actually originate from the morning glory family, and white potatoes are coming from the nightshade family. Potatoes are 80% water, 80% water. That's good news. That means that potatoes end up being lower in calorie density than a lot of other foods that you may think of. But there's even more good news to that, which I'll talk about later. They're composed of carbohydrate, everybody knows that, but they also have protein and fiber and essentially no fat. White potatoes are naturally very low in fat. There's some there, but very little. And what's so cool is the fiber. It has soluble, insoluble fibers and resistant starch. And you can increase the percentage of resistant starch by cooking 
and then cooling your potatoes before you eat them. And you don't necessarily even have to eat them cold. You can reheat them and it still has more resistant starch after it's been cooled. The white potato actually contains all essential amino acids. I did not know that before I started doing research on the white potatoes. Nobody talks about that. You hear about quinoa and those kinds of things. But honestly, it's not that big of a deal that a food has all essential amino acids because we're not eating just one food and our bodies are smart. You don't have to get all your essential amino acids from one food because we're eating a variety of different plant foods. They have different amino acids and our body knows how to get what it needs from different foods, okay? But it's still cool, which explains another cool fact about the potato is that it was the first vegetable grown in space in 1995. So cool. The reason is, is because they wanted to see whether a potato would even grow in space, but they were thinking of potatoes as an ideal food to serve hungry astronauts, to feed hungry astronauts, and potentially even space colonies in the future if we need to be able to grow our own food in space. So they are studying that and they're studying other vegetables right now, which is really cool. There's obviously lots of challenges to growing plants in space. And it's really interesting that I did a little reading on how they do it. But what's really neat is that potato was the first one and it grew. When they brought it back down to earth to study it, there were no differences. It still had all the nutrients. They could not distinguish the space potato from the earth potato. <laughs> okay. So what else? Potatoes have been around for a very long time. It was first domesticated in the South American Andes 10,000 years ago. We've been eating potatoes for a long time. It's the most commonly consumed vegetable in the United States, and it's the number one vegetable crop and the fourth largest produced crop in the world. We eat a lot of potatoes in the United States and throughout the world. The average American consumes about 55 pounds of potatoes per year, and there's over 400 different edible varieties of potatoes. But here in the United States, we have about 200 varieties available. That's still a lot of diversity, 200 different kinds of potatoes. And one thing that's important to know about potatoes is that the nutrition of the potato, a lot of it is concentrated in its peel. So remember that. Okay, so what are the common potato types that we consume in the United States? Russet, you probably know that one. Red, white, Yukon, otherwise known as the yellow potato, fingerling, purple potato, and petite or new potatoes, which are actually just the young potatoes. And they do have a different consistency whenever you pick them young than if you let them grow big. All right, let's go over the nutrients found in potatoes and why they're cool. Like I said, potatoes are 80% water. And remember, whenever you're adding water, whenever you're adding fiber to a food, it's going to decrease its calorie density. Just for a review, calorie density is the number of calories in an amount of food. But let's just say a pound of food. So calories in a pound of food the way that you decrease or lower the amount of calories in the same weight of food is by adding water, by adding fiber, because water and fiber have no calories. And so because potatoes are so high in water and they're high in fiber, they're actually relatively low in calories compared to other starchy vegetables. They have fiber, they have antioxidants, Potatoes have vitamin C. They have more vitamin C than an orange. We typically think of vitamin C in oranges and fruits and things like that, which they do, but you don't think of potatoes. They also have vitamin B6, choline, folate, iron, calcium, phosphorus, magnesium, zinc, potassium. They have more potassium than the banana, which is the fruit or the food that we typically think of when we're thinking of potassium, niacin, alpha lipoic acid, and quercetin. So potatoes have so many different nutrients. And remember, the peel is important because the peel has many of these nutrients, but that's not unlike other fruits and vegetables. Just think of apples and things like that. There's a lot of nutrients that are found in the peel of plants. 
So you want to keep that in mind. Well, given all of those nutrients that are in the potato, what are the health benefits? Because it's in the nightshade family and because some people, very few percentage of people may have sensitivity sensitivities to nightshades. People think that potatoes cause inflammation. Well, studies show that because they have antioxidants and all of these phytonutrients in them, potatoes might actually help reduce inflammation. Because of their fiber, they may help ease constipation. The resistant starch in potatoes acts as a prebiotic. Remember, we want to get a diversity of plants in our diet because all of these different starches, all of these different fibers feed our gut microbiome. And we want to keep our gut microbiome happy. We want to support them. We want to keep them vital. And we do that by all of these different plants. But potatoes are unique in that they have a lot of resistant starch. And like I said before, if you cook, then cool, then heat again, even more resistant starch may lower blood pressure and decrease the risk of heart disease, may help with depression and stress. There's actually a book that's called, I think it's called Potatoes Not Prozac or something like that. And it talks about using potatoes to treat mental or mood disorders, depression, things like that. Very interesting may enhance learning and memory. They've done a study to show that potatoes may help with that, especially in older adults. Supports healthy digestion. Can help restore electrolyte balance in athletes. Remember how I, I read you in these nutrients? Potassium, magnesium, carbohydrates. It's got all of these things that might be depleted if you are a high performance athlete. It sounds like an ideal food for an athlete. And purple potatoes specifically, there's also purple sweet potatoes, but I'll talk about that in a different episode. But I just had to mention them because I love purple sweet potatoes. But purple white potatoes, they're the white potatoes, but they're purple. Wow, that was really confusing. They may help reduce the risk of colon cancer. And it may be because of the specific nutrients found in purple vegetables, okay? Um, so... The, that's the health benefits. How much should we be eating? As a reminder, I am just giving the U.S. Dietary Guidelines recommendations just so that you can get an idea of how much might be part of a healthy diet. So the U.S. Dietary Guidelines recommend aiming for at least three cups of vegetables per day. Potatoes are considered a vegetable. They are a vegetable, even though sometimes we don't eat them in the healthiest way. How much is a serving of potatoes? It is a cup mashed, boiled, or baked, or one medium potato weighing about 148 grams. Okay, that is a serving. So easily you can incorporate it. Remember that the U.S. Dietary Guidelines are giving us minimums, not maximums. So if you want more, eat more. How can you incorporate potatoes into your meals? Well, the possibilities are endless. Let me just give you some ideas. And literally, these are things that I just dreamt up one night. I'm sure my stomach was growling while I made this list. Easy peasy, you can bake it, stuff it with some plant-based bean chili and some salsa. It is delicious that way. Make baked potato bars for your family. We do that every once in a while. You can do it with white potatoes, super easy. Roast your potatoes along with an array of colorful veggies, maybe including some other root veggies. It's the fall right now here, and oh, it is that time of year where I really just crave those heartier vegetables. Roasted rosemary is one of my very favorite uh, spices and herbs to use. Speaking of rosemary, my next idea is mashed and seasoned with rosemary. So yummy. If you have an air fryer, take advantage. Air fry it have it along with your veggie burger. You can make a potato salad, like a fresh potato salad with some fresh dill. I love dill and potato salad. Creamy potato soup, said it's fall. Potato soup is perfect for the fall. Simply boil them and add some sea salt, fresh herbs. Uh, Dr. Uh, Nitu Bajekal recently posted on Instagram that she likes to have some boiled new potatoes with Dijon mustard. So simple, yet so satisfying. 
you can get fancy and make some gnocchi pasta. And that is pasta where you use some flour and it could even be gluten-free flour and mashed potatoes and make it into pasta and boil it. Have it with a rusty, a rusty, rustic hearty vegetable tomato soup or tomato sauce to have with it. So another thing that you could do is potato waffles. I have made this before where you actually boil or bake some potatoes and then you put it into the waffle iron and make a waffle out of them and it gets crispy on the outside but it is nice and creamy on the inside. Have that with some roasted broccoli and some cashew cheesy sauce. So yummy. Skillet fries with black beans and guacamole and hash browns with a tofu scramble and hot sauce. I knew I was going to read that list and get hungry all over again, and I did. So potatoes, you can use anywhere. Breakfast, lunch, dinner, snacks. I know that Dr. Gregor has said that he likes having potatoes, or he did when he was in med school or in residency maybe, and he would bake the potato, and in the winter he would put it in his pocket and it would warm his hands on the way to where he was walking and then he would eat it as a snack or eat it as breakfast. So anyway, lots of things you can do with potatoes and definitely even just a plain potato as a snack is super simple and super easy to incorporate. So here are some fun facts about potatoes. Potatoes are grown in 125 countries around the world. Like I said, in 1995, they were the first vegetable grown in space. Thomas Jefferson is thought to have introduced French fries to America when they were served at a White House dinner. So you may know, the only reason I know this, y'all, I'm not a history buff. The only reason I know that Thomas Jefferson was in France for a long time, the ambassador to France, is because of Hamilton, the musical, which is literally the best musical ever created in the history of the world, the end. Okay, so anyway, he introduced them to the White House. He served them there, and then Americans since then have not stopped eating them. Speaking of, over half of the potatoes in the U.S. are sold for making French fries. Oh my gosh, half. A study of 40 common foods found potatoes to be the most filling. I'm going to talk about that a little bit more. And like I said, you can increase the resistant starch in potatoes by cooling them after cooking. It's not a huge increase, but might, might be up to 6% more resistant starch. Idaho is known as the potato state. And potatoes are used to make some alcoholic beverages, vodka, akvavit, and poitin. I have no clue if I'm pronouncing those correctly. It is considered one of the most environmentally friendly vegetables, which is something we need to be thinking about right now because climate change is real, because we're producing so much waste, we need more sustainable methods to grow our food and have enough food to feed our almost 8 billion people on this planet. So remember that, this poor potato. It's been accused of being so evil, but it has all of these amazing attributes. Potatoes have more vitamin C than an orange, more potassium than a banana, and more fiber than an apple. So we should really be happy that potatoes exist. And my last fun fact is that Mr. Potato Head, everybody knows who Mr. Potato Head is, was the first children's toy advertised on television. Okay, so I keep talking about how potatoes have gotten this bad reputation. Maybe you know why, maybe you don't know why. Obviously, it's a food that has a lot of carbohydrates. It is a starchy vegetable, okay? So we know that, and that's an advantage to these foods because they help us feel full. However, there's another little kink that's thrown in there, and that is the glycemic index. So Dr. David Jenkins was on the team that helped develop the glycemic index. And the glycemic index is a way to measure the rise of your blood sugar after you eat a certain food. Everything is compared to just table sugar or white bread, and basically they compare foods to those to those standards of like, okay, this is where we're going to say that this is one, and then everything is either higher or lower than that. Unfortunately, white potatoes, 
depending on how they're cooked, might have a high glycemic index compared to other foods, which means that it causes a sharper and steeper, is that the same thing? It causes a steeper and maybe faster blood sugar rise after you eat them compared to other foods. And so that's why some people have claimed that white potatoes are not a healthy food. Okay, so, and it really depends on how the potato is cooked. So apparently a uh, russet potato that is baked has one of the highest glycemic indexes. Now, one of the things I don't know is when they study that, if they study it including the peel or not. Because when I have looked at studies, when it's comparing potatoes eaten, it usually is peeled potatoes. So that's one thing to maybe think about. If you know the answer to that and you wanna email me, let me know, yami at dryami.com. But here's, here's when it comes to the glycemic index, okay? What's really important is that Dr. David Jenkins and his team never intended the glycemic index to be used in isolation. And the reason is, is because it can be very misleading. The glycemic index of a Snickers bar might actually be pretty low. I don't think anybody is considering that to be a health promoting food. The reason that some foods might be misleadingly lower than others is because of their fat content. Fat decreases gastric emptying. That means it causes the food to leave your stomach slower than other foods that are, that are lower in fat. And because of that, your blood sugar may not rise as quickly, but nobody's going to tell you, oh yeah, the GI or the glycemic index of Snickers is lower. So that should be a better food than carrots or potatoes in their whole form. And so that's why it's very important when we look at the glycemic index to take it for what it is, take it as just one aspect of how we can look at a food that otherwise has lots of health benefits. So how I would want you to look at a food first is whether it's whole or minimally processed versus moderately or ultra processed. Obviously ultra processed foods have so many risk factors associated with them with artificial added colors, you know, lots of ingredients, as including salt, sugar, added fats, processed fats, those kinds of things. So we know that those foods are not going to be as health promoting as a whole food or a minimally processed food. So that's the first thing I want you to look at. The second thing I want you to look at is plants versus not plants, okay? Is this a food that has fiber, that has antioxidants, that has phytonutrients, that has lots of water content in it? That's how I want you to look at the second thing. And then glycemic index is going to apply mostly to people who are facing insulin resistance, people who have diabetes, people who have metabolic dysregulation. They're maybe in the process of healing that, maybe in the process of working with that, trying to improve their insulin sensitivity. But in the meantime, they may need to watch specific foods that they're eating because for them, it may cause their blood sugars to get dangerously high. But for those of us that have a metabolism that is working properly and we have good insulin sensitivity, which if you're eating a lot of whole plant foods, that is going to be so good for your insulin sensitivity, then eating potatoes in the context of everything else that you're eating is not a bad thing, especially if you're eating the peel as well and you're getting that nutrient density from that potato. So remember glycemic index is not the end all be all of foods. It is not the only way to look at it. And I am going to make sure that you have a link to Dr. David Jenkins when he was speaking at one of the Dr. McDougall advanced study weekends. Maybe we'll put a clip or two in this episode as well so that you can hear it from him directly of what he thinks of the glycemic index, how we should use it. And he, which was on the team that created the glycemic index, actually advocates 
for a plant-based or a predominantly plant-based diet, not just for our health, but also for the environment and sustainability. Okay. So, you know, he says in the, the little clip that Dr. McDougall has on his website that we need to go back to the plant foods that we've neglected. And that glycemic index is just one indicator and there's more indicators when it comes to choosing our foods. Okay. So I think that that is one of the main reasons potatoes has been devalued and put on this list of bad foods. But if you love potatoes, I want you to think about eating potatoes. And there's another reason for that. So I'm going to go over. This is super, super interesting. And I've known this for a while. But potatoes are actually one of the most satiating foods that we have available to us. They have done studies on this, repeated studies over and over and over again. So there's not just one study, but there was this Hallmark study in 1995. It was published in the European Journal of Clinical Nutrition entitled A Satiety Index of Common Foods. In the abstract, they said the highest SI, which is satiety index score, was produced by boiled potatoes, which was seven fold higher than the lowest SI score of the croissant. So basically croissants are not satisfying. If you've ever found yourself eating multiple croissants in one sitting and you're still hungry, this is the reason the satiety index of croissants is very, very low. They went on to say the amount of energy eaten immediately or 120 minutes later after 120 minutes correlated negatively with the mean satiety responses, meaning that the more satisfying a food was, the less you were going to eat 120 minutes later. Protein, fiber, and water content of the test foods correlated positively with satiety index scores, whereas fat content was negatively associated. Isn't that interesting? So the more protein, fiber, and water of the foods, the more satisfying, the more fat, the less satisfying. That is fascinating. Okay, and then I want to just point out what they studied in this study was russet potatoes peeled and boiled for 20 minutes, stored overnight, and reheated in the microwave for two minutes before serving. That is the potato that they tested in this study. And they have a really cool graph on page 682, which shows the satiety index score. Potatoes like literally blew everything else out of the water. It goes from zero to 400. The food that they use to test everything against and to create this index, the satiety index was white bread, which they put at 100. So white bread was considered satiety index of 100. Potatoes go up to almost 400 and the croissant, which was the one that was the least satisfying. It's about at a 50 ish. I also circled here porridge, which is one of my favorites was around 250. There was, uh, in the protein rich foods category, you know, I don't love naming things by macronutrients, but in the protein rich foods categories, the highest was fish, which was around 250, but you would be surprised that cheese, eggs, and steak were a lot lower than you think because we typically tend to believe in our society that these animal products, animal muscle is so satisfying and that really we should be focusing on that, which this study is showing me that whole plant foods can actually be more satisfying than animal muscle. Okay. So we need to start reframing that. And when you look at oranges and apples, they're nearly as satisfying. Yeah. They're a little bit higher actually than steak, oranges and apples. The satiety index of those foods were higher than steak. Okay, so let's stop spreading the myth that eating meat is more satisfying than eating plants. Now, potatoes, it blew everything else out of the water, really. And study after study has shown this. So let me go over another study. 
they did the, this is from 2018, so not too long ago, from the journal called Nutrients, entitled Subjective Satiety Following Meals Incorporating Rice, Pasta, and Potato. So now they're comparing potato to other carbohydrate-rich foods, specifically jasmine rice, penne pasta, and an agria potato. Now, I'm assuming that this rice was just white rice, which will make a difference in satiety. I recommend if we're gonna be eating rice that we eat brown rice because it has that fiber incorporated into it. Penne pasta, interestingly, pasta, the glycemic index of pasta is actually lower than you would think. And it has to do with the way that it's processed, the way that it's dried. And so when we eat pasta, it doesn't have quite as much of a glycemic index or quite as high as a glycemic index than you would imagine. But they found in this study that participants felt less hungry following potato than following rice or pasta and felt fuller, more satisfied, and wanted to eat less following the potato compared with rice and pasta meals. The superior satiating effect of potato compared with rice and pasta in a mixed meal was consistent with its lower energy density. Wow, that's really amazing. You know, like this is not something that we've been talking about a lot. A lot of people just think of the potato as just this empty filler that's doing nothing for you. But I told you all of the nutrients that are in a potato. This study from, what is this journal? The American Society for Nutrition. It is from 2013. It's entitled White Vegetables, colon, Glycemia and Satiety. This is a review article by Anderson et al. And I just wanted to read part of the, the abstract here that says, as illustrated by using the potato as an example, the glycemic index of white vegetables can be misleading if not interpreted in the context of the overall contribution that the white, pot- that the white vegetable makes to the carbohydrate and nutrient composition of the diet and their functionality in satiety and metabolic control within usual meals. It is concluded that application of the glycemic index in isolation to judge the role of white vegetables in diet and specifically in the case of potato as consumed in ad libitum meals has led to premature and possibly counterproductive dietary guidance. Okay. Let me interpret that for you because that was a lot of big words. Basically what that's saying is there's lots of nutrients in white vegetables, including in white potatoes. And because we have interpreted white potatoes as being bad just because they may have a higher glycemic index, it actually may be more harmful than helpful telling people not to eat white potatoes. That is what this review article was saying. I think I highlighted something else. In on page 359, They talked about how the resistant starch goes up when cooled. So that was only about 6% compared to hot potatoes. That's important to know. And there was one more thing, I think. No, not in this article, probably in another article. I have one more article to talk to you about, which is from the European Journal of Clinical Nutrition. It's called Glycemic and Satiating Properties of Potato Products. So they looked at different potato products. They looked at boiled potatoes, french fries, and mashed potatoes. And they found that boiled potatoes actually induced a higher subjective satiety than french fries compared on an energy equivalent basis. So that that means when they looked at two meals, one with boiled potatoes, one with french fries, both having the same amount of calories, the boiled potatoes were more satisfying than the french fries. So that's really important to know that different ways of cooking our potatoes may affect our satiety and that even though french fries, which have a bunch of fat, which we think of that as maybe the fat decreasing our gastric emptying, the boiled potatoes without fat, actually were more satisfying. So 
that is really, really interesting and something to keep in mind as well. So that is the episode on potatoes. I hope that this encourages you to think more about eating potatoes and maybe decreases your fear about potatoes because that's really what I want to do is to encourage you to incorporate more potatoes into your life. On my Instagram and on my newsletter. If you haven't already joined my newsletter, if you go to dryami.com forward slash free, pick out a freebie, you'll be added to my newsletter. I am adding a link and description to a mashed potatoes recipe from the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine, which has no added overt fats and delicious and fluffy and creamy using some plant milk and nutritional yeast and spices to make it really yummy. And I hope that this Thanksgiving, you are going to enjoy your mashed potatoes. We have mashed potatoes every Thanksgiving because it's my older son, he loves mashed potatoes. So, and hopefully we will have it more often now that I've done this episode. Veggie lovers, thank you so much for hanging in there with me on this episode. I really hope that this taught you something you didn't know before and now you feel a little better, including white potatoes in your life, boiled, mashed, baked, whatever it is. Just eat it as part of your health promoting, nutritious, beautiful whole whole food plant-based diet and it's going to be great. So no worries. Thank you all for joining me on this episode and I hope that you have a very plantastic day. Hey veggie lover, I hope that you loved today's episode. Will you take a second and do me a huge favor? Please subscribe to my podcast so that you never miss an episode. You're the reason I'm here and I want to share it all with you. Thank you for listening and have a plantastic day.